So, yeah, so we're just going to talk about, you know, what might make an Australian native pond. You know, fish, plants and um, other things that you can put in a pond. So, um, yeah, and so what we'll do is we will go to, there we go. Um, yeah, so the first thing we'll look at is we'll look at a whole bunch of, what's a whole bunch of natural water bodies, just to give you a bit of an idea as to what sort of looks you could go for in a pond. Because you're probably not wanting to go for the little twee round thing with a couple of water lilies and some goldfish or koi in it. It's not really native. I've so, got that. That's what so, I yeah. <laughs> so if you're going for a pure native one, you want to you know, yeah. pinch some ideas from somewhere and you'll get some ideas as to how they look then. So this one's up in the Blue Mountains, you know, one of the streams coming off the headwaters. You get lots of rocks where you get a good current flow because it knocks everything else out. So, and that's got... Um, and where there's good current flow, you often get a lot of lamandras at the edges as well. So it's up in the Blue Mountains, Georges River headwaters. That's a little bit less slower moving. It's got a rock base. You can see the rushes there, Potamageetans floating in there. And um, a bit, so Upper Mile River. So it's quite nice there. Um, you're getting, you know, the rocks and gravel again, lots of lamandras because when you do get a current through, you know, if you've ever tried to pull lamandras out, you know how tough they are. So they don't tend to not move. So lamandras are pretty common next to um, waterways. And there's lots of um, lily pillies and stuff in some of those um, rainforest gullies. Um, a bit further north, you get the Never Never Creek, which is in an area they call the Promised Land. Oh, so, yes. Yeah, now lovely area just north of Bellingen there, worth a drive. Again, you've got the flowing rivers with all the rocks, you've got lamandras there, and you've got the water houses and zygiums through there. But then you get down to the lowest reaches of the Gross River, and it's a bit stiller, it's sandy bottoms, you'll see the reeds at the edges, casuarinas further in. But, you know, when there's a big rain event on, this will scour out pretty solidly. But it's got a lot of deep sand there. Closer to home for you guys, Piles Creek. Oh. Mm. Yep. You know, sandstone, there's a lot of... Piles Creek got a lot more ferns around the side of them as well and sedges and uh, and boscolonium that yell, you spell restio tetraphyllus. And, um, you know, so it's got some nice... Nice bits there. You can pick out bits there. Or if you go to a still area where there's no flow, you can go to Thirlmere Lakes. And Thirlmere is the south side of Sydney, and it's quite ancient. There's actually a species of freshwater sponge found in here. Oh. And that still water. And what you can see here is you can see left to its own devices how it's zoned. So you can see in the middle there's some floating plants there. You can see shallower stuff around the edges you know, working their way up to the um, the trees and stuff. So you can see the sort of the way water naturally zones itself there. Mm. Um, a lot of the Thirlmere Lakes is actually drained now because of coal mining. Uh -huh. they've, they've cracked the rock beds at the base of it. Mm. I think I've measured the highest pH in one of those I've ever measured. It was about 3.2, mm. or the lowest pH, I should say. Um, Lawla River, this is in the Upper Man River. So the very headwaters of the rivers, you get these little swampy areas where the water comes through. And a lot of these swampy areas are a bit like a full of mosses and that. They're a bit like a giant sponge. They fill up and soak up when it rains and then they slowly drain down as things dry out. So um, so that's how come you get, you know, continuous water flow is that these areas, sort of areas, these upper reaches there. And they have lots of interesting little plants there in them. And then a bit further downstream in the Man River, but still upper reaches, you know, where the water flow gets heavy, you get nice big granite boulders. So if you like rocks, there's your rock, there's your rock in inspiration. And there's some casuarinas. And most of the streams around the East Coast, you'll get one of the two casuarinas there. Most of the ones further inland, it's all Cunninghamiana. Closer to the coast, it's um, Casuarina Glauca, where it's a bit more salty. 
so you can almost always see them at the sides. Um, you go up to the Snowy River at Kosciuszko and stuff, you'll get nice streams and rocks through there. Um, you know, it looks quite attractive, and there's even fish up there. And you know, this the little white patches you can see just up in the corner there, there near the rocks that's actually still a bit of snow melt, so the water temperature here is only a degree or two. And then you get the little pools up there. Get a pond that looked like that, you'd be pretty happy. It's got, you know, the plants in there, the um, uh, all nice crystal clear water. Um, the thing, that's the other thing that you get with a lot of Australian things. A lot of the water bodies are ephemeral. So this pool, by the end of summer, will probably be bone dry. Mm. So the plants, they survive being underwater and then and then out of it. So a lot of the plants are adapted to um, conditions that allow that. Going up to Hafford and Tablelands, you get some of the waterfalls. So nice bits of rocks and stuff flowing over. Um, you can get some of the tropical creeks, so Henrietta Creek. So there's some you know, rainforest plants all around the edges, ferns, and there's some plants in the water that are fairly tough in there. Um, further in, Melanda Falls, just downstream, little tropical creek with um, lots of ferns and some of the tropical gingers in there. And then you can even get things that are about the right scale for a garden pond. The one on the top left there, that's um, Upper Piles Creek there. If you go along the, the Great North Walk, there's a few little holes filled in there. And that's got a reed or two. The, um, the, the slightly thicker one at the edge is the, um, the philidrium, the fully frog's mouth, and there's a couple of little bits of um, macroalgae in the base of it there. And the other one is a bit further north, but again, you know, where there's a little bit water or fill, plants will grow. But even if you can't do a pond, you can always fit a little thing in. That's one a few years ago at Martin Robinson's place, which is basically a water bowl on his balcony. So it's just a ceramic pot. You can buy the ceramic pots without the hole in them, um, or if you buy the glazed pot with a hole, just plug it up and you, it's cheaper with the holes in them. The ones they sell for the water features tend to be more expensive. So, But you just plug it up with a bit of concrete and seal it and you know you can turn any pot into a water feature. And there's about four different species of plants in there and Martin will have some fish and other bits in there as well. So you don't need a whole lot of space. The birds will come and they'll happily... Um, drink out of that and splash in there and make a bit of a mess but you know so you can fit them in a small really small space if you want to so we're looking at ponds you want to think about a few things before you just whack your pond in you want to know what you know what your, what your purpose is for the pond is it to do fit an aesthetic need are you trying to attract birds wildlife or other things you know um you know, because the purpose for what the reasons why you're putting the pond in, you know, gives you a bit of a hint as to how you might want to design it and stuff. Um, location, you probably don't want to stick your pond in the full sun. You get a 40 degree day, your pond is going to get quite warm. So if you can make sure that it's shaded in the heat of the day, it doesn't have to be directly under the trees, but you just need to make sure it gets shaded from that north and west sun so it doesn't um, cop too much. Um, there. Um, the other thing to do with location too is you may not want to put your front pond under your bedroom window or under your neighbour's bedroom window because <laughs> if the frogs find it, yeah. they can get quite noisy at night and you might find that sticking it near your bedroom is not the best place. Um, you should think about you know, design features and you should think about like what happens when you get a lot of rain and the water overflows in your pond. Because that's how things from your pond end up, you know, if you, especially if you're near a creek, end up in the local waterways. And you can, you, you pick your overflow point, your low point, and you might make it so there's a bit of fly screen or shade cloth or mesh or something so the water can get out, but your pond contents can't. Um, preparation, if you're making, putting a pond in, you don't, Dig the hole, whack the line or the concrete in, fill it up with water and throw the fish in. Everything will die if you do that. You need to give it a little bit of time for the water to settle, for the chlorine to 
age out of the water. If it's a concrete pond, you scrub it a couple of times with vinegar or something just to get rid of the um, the lime and stuff from it to let that age first. Um, plants plants are great for your pond. They have good water purifiers. They'll take up all of the waste and you know that fish and other animals do, and they say that's fertilizer I'm going to grow. Um, but the other trick with plants is if you use them in containers, then when you do clean the pond out, you can pull the containers with the plants out. You can scoop the stuff out of the pond and then you put the containers back in. So it makes it a little bit easier to maintain. Having done ponds where I've lined the bottom with gravel and planted into the gravel, cleaning them afterwards is a bit of a pain. Um, and you think about may putting marginal plants in which sit at the edge that stick up. So fish, um, preferably, you know, from the local area, you don't, and you want to make sure, as I say, there's that sort of overflow screen because it's the fish, some of the ferals, you know, all of the carp on the east coast and the wild goldfish, they've all come from somebody's ponds. You know, you get a big storm event, it overflows and, and stuff. You go to Greenpoint Creek down at Patonga there, I can catch you buckets of white cloud mountain minnows, which are not native, and I can give you odds that they're all in the back ponds of, um, or they were in the back ponds of people in the area. Um, it's just a try with the video, you didn't. If you're after frogs, you know, <laughs> you, for frogs, you just want to, basically, if you build it, they will come. Once they work out there's water and there's shelter, frogs tend to turn up. Um, you just need a bit of shelter around the pond, so somewhere for the frogs to hide during the day. Um, Lamandras are often pretty good for that. Uh, you need to be able to access the pond. And you need to make sure you've got the right fish in there because the wrong fish will just go, thank you very much, that frog's a nice snack. And the tadpoles certainly are. And you need to, ponds Ponds are not entirely set and forget. You need to do periodic cleaning and water changes. Oh, and the other thing with fish too, um, Temptation people like to feed the fish and stuff, but there's a tendency often to overfeed. Um, you lose more fish from overfeeding than underfeeding. And if you put too much food in, it goes off and spoils the water at any rate. So if you keep them slightly on the hungry side, then they'll, um, they'll eat the mosquito wrigglers and anything else that turns mm -hmm. up. So, so here's a picture of some design features in a frog pond, the plants in containers. Sure using rocks and that to hide the pond liners with little gaps and stuff where frogs can come in, a nice sloping ramp so the frogs can get out because whilst tree frogs can climb and they've got the suction pads, not all the, not all the other frogs can climb out. So, you know, you need to think about how the frogs enter and exit from there. This is a commercial aquaculture pond where they've actually put in a screened overflow. So when the water overflows, it goes out through the um, the screened mesh there and out so that their stuff stays in their pond and it controls the water level there. Um, next one is somebody up near Cairns that I know. He's got a frond pond, but he had to keep the cane toads out. Of course, cane toads, tadpoles are poisonous as well as the cane toads. And if you're wanting a nice pond up there, so he's got a little glass enclosure. Cane toads can't climb and they can't jump very high. So about a, about 12 inches or so worth of barriers enough to stop them. But yeah, but that's a lot of tropical natives in there. So there, yeah, but yeah, different things you can do. You've got to cater for for your ponds. So what we might look at next is what some of the fish you can put in your ponds are. So yeah, so there's a bunch bunch of names. So Pacific blue eyes, um, the problem with getting them from a lot of the aquarium shops, the Pacific blue eyes, is that they're often um, coming from further north. And um, so the ones from further north are bigger and more aggressive as the local ones are better at handling the cold and other conditions. Um, Firetail gudgeons often sold in aquarium shops as feeder fish. Um, because they're often an aquaculture pond byproduct. Um, there's smell, there's empire gudgeons. I'll go through these with photos. The different jolly tails. 
And then there's some rainbow fish, but there's no rainbow fish this far south or this far east. So inland, you get the Murray River rainbow fish. Further north from Port Macquarie, further north, you get the crimson spotted rainbow fish. And a little bit further north again, you get the ornate rainbow fish. So let's look at the fish. So there's Australian smelt, which are Pina simoni. So they're small, they're fast moving fish. They actually like good current flow. So I wouldn't be put, I'd only be putting them in a very big pond with a big clear water area and they're a bit finicky to handle. So, but they're a lovely little thing if you can do them. Um, one that you definitely, if you can get the local ones, you should be doing is Pacific Blue Eyes, Pseudomugal Signifer. So the males have the coloured fins, the females are just plain coloured, so the top photo has a pair of them. Um, they're normally yellow with the black and white edging on the fins. Um, they'll take, actually you tend to find them most commonly in the estuaries, but they'll, they'll happily survive in full fresh as well. Um, you can actually catch these fish if you can, if you've got a um, recreational fishing license. Because they'll let you catch fish, because they'll let you put it on a hook and catch it as bait, so you're just keeping the bait in a pond for a while. So, um, fire tail gudgeon, so the top's a male, the bottom's a female, the female's, um, not far off from laying eggs there. So they're brown. You tend to not see them so much in the pond because they tend to hide at the bottom. Oh, one of the other tricks with a native fish, you'll see that they've got a double fin on them at the top. Most of the native fish tend to have the two fins. So even if we went back to the blue eyes, they've got the two fins, two fins. And then if we look at the um, some of the flathead gudgeons, double fins. It just helps you when you're looking, is it a mosquito fish or one of the ferals? Most of the natives tend to have that double dorsal fin. So there's dwarf flathead gudgeon at the top, which has a very large mouth for its size, and the uh, normal flathead gudgeon. Um, so they're there. Um, lovely fish there, empire gudgeon. Um, a little bit bigger, they'll get up to about, up to about eight to 10 centimetres in size. Um, the male colours up brightly when it's in breeding time. Um, to actually breed them, you actually they actually need a marine larval stage. So they'll lay their eggs. The young will flush down the down to the the estuaries where, and then the, once they're bigger, they'll start to swim back upstream. And a lot of Australian fish do that, which is why some of the dams and weirs represent a bit of a problem because they can't move like they naturally do. And then there's the um, Striped gudgeon and coxes gudgeon. The tops, the coxes. The bottoms, the striped. The coxes gudgeon tends to be found in the more upstream in the headwaters. It'll actually climb almost vertical surfaces, and the striped gudgeon's a bit further downstream. They get they get a little bit bigger. They'll get you know a reasonable size on them. Um, if you're up in the mountain areas, there's the mountain jolly tails, Galaxia solidus. Um, you know, they're found up in the Blue Mountains and up in the headwaters. They're very good climbers and stuff. So they, they're pure fresh. Whereas further downstream, you get the Galaxias maculatus, a common, common jolly tail. Um, you can, lots of the, um, bait and tackle shops, the fish shops, you buy frozen bags of this as white bait for you putting on your hooks for fish. Because again, these breed in the estuaries and then the young do a big run up stream. So they tend to catch them when they're, they're doing their big uh, migration back into the freshwater. Um, one that's found in the estuaries and aimed to the fresh a little bit, the Ambassus marianus, the glass perchlet. When they're a bit younger, they're completely transparent. You can see right through them. So they're quite interesting for that. Again, look, double fin, you know, that double, double fin thing. Um, now, if we look there, we have um, the crimson spotted rainbow fish. So that's the one from the east coast that's found from Port Macquarie up to about Rockhampton in the Queensland, all along the coastal drainages. Crimson spotted rainbow fish, called crimson spotted because it's got that crimson spot on its cheek there on the gills. Mm. Um, they've got the nice lines and patterns on there. Lovely fish, lovely pond fish. Um, very good for mosquito control. The top photo, males at the front, the females at the back. So the male tends to have 
bit more ornate colouring and stuff. And a lot of these rainbow fish, when you go up into the headwaters, you'll get more brightly coloured fish in the headwaters than down in the main body of the river. Because if you're a really brightly coloured fish in the main body of the river, you get noticed and you end up being somebody's lunch. Whereas up in the headwaters, you can survive a bit more and not be so noticed. So, um, and then the Murray River rainbow fish is very similar. And I'm sure they were originally once one species before the, um, dividing range split them off and separated them. So the Murray River rainbow fish is often widely sold in aquarium shops. Actually, both of those are commonly sold. Um, but what I think is the nicest of the rainbow fish that's a bit harder to find is Redness centris ornatus, the soft spine rainbow fish. So the red one at the top there is um, from Evans Head, some really tannin stained water there. And the, um, the iridescent blue one is from a creek just um, west of Coffs Harbour, Pine Creek. So it gets the different colour forms and all of that. And I think they've done some DNA work on the Radnus centris and what's listed as one species is actually, I think they've decided on the DNA is about five. Um, but somebody, taxonomist, has to formally go and name and describe them. And of those five species, some of them would automatically be critically endangered because they like to live in exactly the spots we want to do all their coastal development in. So, but they're lovely little fish. I've kept them in a bowl on a desktop and they bred and they had babies and they didn't bother them. Um, you know, so they're, they're lovely to look after, nice fish. Um, but yeah, so next we move on to the other critters. So it's not just fish you can put in your pond. You can put all sorts of other things. As I say, frogs sort of, it's almost if you build it, they will come and the design can assist. And people often go, oh, we want, you know, what's our frog-friendly fish? The, answer, the correct answer is there isn't any because if you want something that eats mosquito wrigglers and doesn't eat tadpoles, there's a point where the size of mosquito wrigglers and the size of tad, but young tadpoles overlap. So in essence, what you're after is something with a... Because fish will basically eat whatever fits in their mouth. So you want something with a small enough mouth that it can't eat tadpoles once they get above a certain size. So what you do is if you're doing it, you put the smaller fish in with a smaller mouth and you put plenty of vegetation in so there's cover for the tadpoles to hide amongst. Um, so crustaceans, you get... There's a lot of freshwater crayfish and freshwater prawns. You know, it's not just the marine ones. Uh, a lot of snails and mussels and mollusks. Um, a lot of things like mosquito larvae, dragons, like a lot of the insect type animals will just arrive in your pond because they'll just fly there and lay their eggs. And the dragonfly nymphs, they'll fairly heavily predate your tadpoles any anyway. rate. Um, there's a lot of planktonic animals you can get, Daphnia and Cyclops and other things. Um, if you want to get some of the really planktonic and little things, what you need to do is just get a scoop of water or a bit of mud from an existing water body and put it in and that'll seed your um, your pond with um, all these other critters. And then there's turtles and lizards and other reptiles you can get. So so if we look, there's a few a couple of different types of freshwater mussels. There's a few there with a shrimp on one of them. Um, then you get the Daphnia and Moina, they call them water fleas. And you can see on the one in the middle there, the bit of green there is because it's been eating all the algae that's floating in the water. So they they will help clear your water up and they just hop around. The fish love to eat these things. Um, you get dragonfly nymphs and back swimmers as different bits. So, um, And then one of the nicer ones to get is a, a glass shrimp, the Paratea australis. It's quite commonly found in most of the creeks and that are around. It just eats algae. It doesn't eat anything else. It's a good one for for just, you know, keeping your pond tidy and uh, just getting rid of some of that um, brush algae. Whereas the shrimp you're not quite so keen on are the long arms with the macrorachium because they'll often, they'll often catch fish and tadpoles in those little long nippers and drag them in and eat them. And the photo at the top is a female in berry with lots of eggs on her. So... And then there's a local one from Wyong Shomp. 
It was only named a few years ago, Gramasticus lacus, the eastern swamp crayfish. It only it only gets to about four to five centimetres big. It's quite small. It lives in little burrows. And what a lot of these crayfish do is they'll dig a deep little burrow in the hole in there so the swamp will dry up, but there'll still be a little bit of water at the bottom of their hole. So they'll survive that way. Um, the other ones you get, you get lots of Euastigus, the spiny crayfish, and just about every river system has its own species of this because they can't, they can't really migrate between river basins. They can't go out to sea and come back up. They don't like the salt water. So pretty much every separate river drainage has its own species of these up the coast. So there's quite a lot of different species in different spots. Um, there's frogs, they get the very tiny little dwarf green tree frog, Littoria phallax. Um, they love to hide in Lamandra, um, but you get the bigger tree frogs that you know, and you get the striped marsh frog, and the striped marsh frog's the one that, and when it's a warm sunny night, they'll try and sit in your down drain pipes and make a sound of tock, 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 like a dripping tap. And they love the echo they get from the bottom of your downpipes because it makes them sound like they're a much bigger frog. So when they're calling the ladies, they get noticed better. So, and they're ones that striped marsh frogs, pretty common, but they, they don't have the suckers, so they need a bit of help to get in and out of the ponds. Um, reptiles, there's a whole bunch of different reptiles. The top corner there, the top right top, is a baby eastern long neck turtle. It's probably only just hatched. Um, because um, the long neck turtles, you know, they hatch, they fold out. And you can actually see a crease underneath them when they've only recently hatched before they've hardened their shell up. Um, and yeah, long neck turtles, turtles are, turtles are good fun to keep. If you've got a reptile keeper's license, you can keep, keep them. Um, and with water dragons and water skinks, you know, they'll turn up the water dragons, bit of personality, bit of character. Um, so yeah, so they're there. They're all all things you can keep in your pond, or we'll turn up to them. So having covered the critters, we might look at some of the plants. And one of the things to think about for the plants is a bit like with your garden plant, where you've got your ground covers, you've got your small shrubs and your your taller shrubs. You think about the aquatic plants the same way. There's those things that live fully in the water. There's those things that like to have their roots in the water but stick their head up. And then there's the things that normally are just found near the edges where it's a bit shadier and sheltered. So so the fully aquatic ones, you know, they're there for the middle of your pond where it's fully in water. So there's some floating plants you can get. There's things where the leaves are at the base but they float to the top. Um, Nymphoides atelia. There's the plants that live fully underwater. There's the ones that have submerged and floating leaves. They're the ones that, you know, so when the pond dries out, they can survive. Stuff around the edges of the pond, broad, narrow. And then there's some small ones. And then there's the riparian ones, which provide just that bit of cover and um, protection for everything. So, so, yeah, so there's the duckweeds. Now, most people tend to lump them all in as lemna. Actually, most of what we see is Spirodella. So if you look at the one where the roots are floating there, that's Spirodella. And you can tell because one, it's purple underneath, and two, it has more than one root per leaf. Lemnas are green underneath and have one root per leaf. So, and they will, if conditions are right, they'll spread and rapidly thing. But what they're good at with those floating roots is they're great for taking excess um, nutrients out of the water. So if you know things have been overfed or there's a bit of other you know stuff in there, they're good for keeping your water quality clean. You know, they'll grow in preference to the algae. So Azola, there you go, there's two species of Australian Azola and folliculoid is an Azola panata. Oh, they're doing the paints. Yeah. Azola that's the one that often goes red in the sun. Um, and that it's a bit tighter. Folliculoides tends to be slightly more shady, cooler spots, a bit looser. 
They're actually ferns, Azola. It's a floating fern. And the true diagnostic feature is the roots. Azola folliculoides has just long, thin roots, whereas Panada has the roots with the um, furry edges on them. So now you're an expert in Azola. That's the Australian Azolas. So, and then there's the um, ribbon weed, Valisneria gigantea. This one, lots of these photos were taken up at, um, or down at um, Gross, down the Pan River where it um, joins the Gross River down at Yarramundi, that's it. Yeah, this gets quite large. And the little spirally things you can see there, that's actually the flowers. But what it does is the flowers come up on a floating stem and they sit outside the water. And then once they've been pollinated, it starts to pull the flowers back in and corks pulls the spiral in. So, um, because that's a problem for an aquatic plant is how do you get your flowers pollinated? Mm. So they normally have mechanisms to try and, you know, come up with some method for doing that. It sticks the little white flowers up above the water. This forms big mats of it there. Um, further north, you start to get a finer one. You get Pallasneria nana, which is a thinner ribbon weed. Um, you also get quite commonly around a lot of um, what they call ma macroalgae, chara and nitella. So they're algae, but they're not as filmy as the other ones. They actually have a bit more structure to them. So chara is a bit coarse and nitella is a bit finer. Um, so they're there. Um, water ribbons, tri triglocan. Um, I think it's had a name change recently to um, synoptican or something like that. So gets flowers. Um, whereas the previous, the Valisneria forms big mats and spreads everywhere, the triglocan nicely stays in one spot. So it's actually a good one for a pot because it's not really going to escape it and grow everywhere. Tends to have um, tubers underneath as well. But yeah, they're, they're quite nice. Um, then you get the Potamogeton, the floating pondweed. This has a different sort of leaf under the water to the leaves that float on the top. Um, you don't get it for its flowers because that's it in full flower. You can see little tiny brown stalks above the leaves. They're the flowers. It's not, but you know, it'll take deeper water, come to the surface. Now, one of the things is we don't have any water lilies down this far south. You've got to go up to the Queensland border to find water lilies. So mm -hmm. what we what we do have though is nymphoides, which are, I thought they were related. They're actually not related to water lilies at all. They're in a completely different family. It's just parallel evolution where they've come up with a very similar leaf structure and everything else. And so that's in a water bowl. The leaves on that nymphoides montana, which has that nice yellow fringe flower, they get to probably about five to six centimetres across. They're fairly small and, you know, not super big. They're, you know, they're, they're reasonably compact. But, you know, they, they work fine. They spread around. I've got still got some of those still floating in some of my ponds out, buckets out the back. And then, I think it's in the newsletter I mentioned, the Poides indica, water snowflake, tends to mainly be found further north. Um, it's only got the same small flowers, but it's got big leaves. The leaves on that are dinner plate size. So they're a large, large much larger leaf. Um, but yeah, they're, they're good. They also, the nymphoides, the things that float, because they shade the water, they help stop a bit of algae growth under the water as well. Probably bring a bit of shade. Um, water ward, one of the mud mats, Elatane gratioloides, that was photographed in about a centimetre or two of water. It's, one of those marginal at the edges. If you put these in an aquarium and you've got high light, you can use it as a little carpeting plant in the aquarium. Um, good for around the edges of your pond. You know, it looks quite nice and neat. Um, Caltrici stagnalis. Depends on what book you read as to whether it's native or introduced. Um, I tend to think it's native. It's found in a lot of areas. A lot of aquatic plants have a really wide distribution because birds, when they fly and migrate, often you have, might have a bit of um, plant hooked around a foot or something. And so when they fly and stop at their next location, the plants often spread. So there's plants around that have really big distributions. A lot of the aquatic ones have a very um, wide wide distribution, and I think this isn't one of those. 
Um, yeah, it's a nice looking plant. Um, there's um, Liliopsis polyantha, which is the one with the um, narrow grassy leaves, and Hydrocotyl tripartita, which has the um, the more clover-like leaves there. They're again shallow water ones. Um, and one of the things, the reason why a lot of the aquatic plants happily grow in the shallow water, if the same plant was growing out of the water, um, they're very tender and juicy and all the wallabies and that'll come and munch them, whereas if they're just under the water, they tend to not be eaten. So it's often an adaption. Um, next, we've got frog's mouth, Philodrum languinosum. This is a really good one for ponds as a pond marginal. It's not, yeah, you know, it gets a little bit of size, not super big. It's a nice pale green leaf. It's soft. It's got flowers. It's it's one that you know definitely recommended for for you know sticking in your pond um, because it's a, you know, a nice good marginal one. It'll stick in a pot at the edge and uh, pop its head out. Um, there's lots of knotweeds and persicaria, so I'm just doing one on that's Lapithofolium, but there's Strigosa, so there's a whole bunch of different ones. They tend to be marginals. I grow with their feet wet if you want them and uh, around the edge of the water. Um, the Ludwigia pelpoides, so that's the native one, whereas there's um, a couple of, there's a couple of other ones that are exotic, but yeah, it's, and it'll grow under the water with one leaf or it'll stick its head out the water and do that. A uh, little one that's quite a nice one, Lobelia alata, the winged Lobelia. Um, it's got little blue flowers. It's in the Scoala family. So it's a, it's a nice little one. Um, for around the edges and stuff, um, Isolepsis. It's nice and architectural if you're after that particular, you know, striking upright thing. And the flowers, little pom-pom flowers aren't too bad on it. Um, you get lots of junkus around. Most of them tend to be a little bit sort of scrappy and messy, but, you know, and the problem with junkus is when you get it in there, getting rid of it, because once it sets seeds, they tend to come up everywhere. So, um, you know, um, probably not good for a garden pond, but if you've got a bigger property, you know, there's the tie for the bulrushes, but they will spread and take over. They will they won't just stay confined to a neat little area. Um, as well as the normal Lamandra um, longifolia and further north is Lamandra hystrix, Lamandra fluviatilis from the Blue Mountains, the fine leaf one. And as I say, Lamandras are good around the edge of the pond. Not only do they fit and look right, but they provide great habitat for frogs and lizards and that to sit under and hide. Another good one that's local to the area there, you find them up in Piles Creek and that's the old um, Beloscium tetraphyllum, the tassel cord rush, rush used to be Restio. You can normally pick that one up in the um, nurseries as well. That comes in male and female plants. So, but it's a nice, nice ornate thing. Bigger ponds, bigger areas. Yep, good old calicoma, the black wattle, always found sort of just near the water lines. Um, you even get the Banksia rover, doesn't mind the swampy and wetter conditions, tends to often hang around those spots. Um, and further north, you know, but also around the thing, calistamins, they all tend to be tend to be found around the creeks, love the creeks. So, so that's there. But yeah, but what we might look at is We'll flip now to, here's some things not to put in your pond. You know, things you might want to avoid, you know, best intentions, but you could, um, you want to just avoid things. There's some feral, there's some non-natives, a few weeds, some plants that you may not want. And then there's a bunch of fish and things that just probably not um, that suitable. So things like, you know, most your aquarium tropical fish. You know, you can probably put them in the pond and you know until winter, and then it gets a bit cold, and that'll knock them all off. Um, you know, so there's a few bits there, so we'll look at a few of those now. So Gambusia, widely promoted, widely bought in because it's supposed to be good for controlling mosquito larvae. Um, it's actually not as good as the native rainbow fish or any of that, and it's damaging the whole ecosystem and. The fish are male and female, so in the photo there, the top is a female, the bottom is a male, and there's a pair of them at the side. And when you see the pair of them, when you see the female with the dark spot near its um, bottom fin there, 
that is the eyes of all the babies. These things are live bearers. So they don't lay eggs and then the male fertilizes the eggs. The male fertilizes the female and the female bears young, live young. So you don't need a pair of them to set up a, to escape. You just need one female. And the female can, from one fertilization event, can for many months produce batches of babies. So they're quite nasty. They will nip the fins of bigger fish. They will strip the um, skin off the side of bigger tadpoles and stuff. So they'll take down things that are bigger than them. They've got an upturned mouth. So they're actually surface feeders. So they tend to hover just under the surface right in the shallow. They will survive really bad water, quality water. So they will tend to live where lots of things will have trouble. Um, the best way in natural environments to sort mosquito fish out or plague minnows, gambusia, is to get the water quality right. If you get good water quality, it gives the natives a fighting chance. But if there's poor water quality, these things will tend to dominate. Um, but yeah, so they're there to be avoided. And you can see on the thing, they've got the rounded thing, you think, but there's only one fin at the top, on the top of the body. There's not that double fin thing. And they've got a flat head, so, you know, you get used to how to pick them. And the fin at the bottom is different between the female and the male. The next one, that's a photo, that's a picture of Piles Creek. And that's a picture of White Cloud Mountain minnows, which come from China. And that was the result of, five, of one scoop in Piles Creek at that point, which is actually upstream of all the houses. It's the back of the tennis courts there. So if you want to get white, white cloud mountain fish for your aquarium, you can go there and you don't have to pay the 3 or $4 that the shops want each for them, you know. But they're lovely fish. I've kept them as a kid. I kept them in an aquarium at home. They're just, And they're actually reasonably peaceful. They're small. They're not super vigorous. They're just not native. They shouldn't be there. Um, that's the problem. They're not as dangerous as the mountain clouds. You'll also get some of those in Piles Creek as well. I suspect they've, I don't know, they're somewhere further upstream or either in either the um, Mount Penang area or somebody might have some of those in a pond that have got out into Piles Creek. Um, carp. So these, the, you know, the pretty koi carp that people have, this is what they turn into after a few generations in the wild. They just revert back to type, which is a big fat fish. And one of the worst problems with carp, not only they big, they actually, they like to pick up mouthfuls of mud from the bottom and sift it through their gills and spit it out. So they tend to make the water dirty and drop the oxygen levels in the water. They can gulp air to get by on the low oxygen levels, but our native fish can't. So they tend to, beyond the damage they actually do, they actually damage the ecosystem itself. Um, next one. That's what happens to goldfish again after a few generations in the wild. Because if you're a fat, brightly coloured fish with a fancy tail, some birds can eat you. So pretty quickly you get rid of the bright colours and the fancy tail and you just get to, to this sort of size. So they're just, they're a bit like the, the carp. So they spit mouthfuls of mud from the bottom, they can gulp oxygen. So again, they tend to degrade the water quality. Um, Here's a couple of feral gobies we found in Sydney Harbour at one stage looking at fish. Um, they probably came as embryo from the ship's ballast water. So nobody would have brought them in, but when the big ships come in, they load their hulls with water to ballast the ship out. I think they've now got regulations where the ships are supposed to change their ballast water over out at sea rather than doing it in the harbour. But it's a bit late. They're all in Sydney Harbour now. So talking about water lilies, you see water lilies in the ponds if you're driving up, you know, past a lot of the farms, in the farm dams and stuff. Most of the water lilies you see is either Nymphaea carulia or Nymphaea mexicana, the yellow one. Um, they're nice water lilies. They're just not native ones. So they're non-natives, the, the Nymphaea. So then Kabomba. Kabomba was fanwort, and this was um, taken. The photo of that was taken up in the Blue Mountains in Glenbrook, in one of the 
one of the lakes up there. This used, this was brought in as an aquarium plant. It's a lovely plant. It's frilly leaves. It's soft and everything. People put them in their ponds because it could take cold water. And now it's no longer in their ponds. And the leaves around, the bigger leaves are actually the Nympho Mexicana, the yellow water lily, which is, so this dam at Glenbrook is just full of um, this. And then another one that was brought in as a pond plant, Myriophyllum aquaticum, parrot's feather. Nice fern, has a different leaf under the water to above the water. This is at, um, down, down near some of the dams, ponds near a botany near the airport. So just you can see, just forms big dense mats and stuff choking everything out. The other problem that happens with some of these plants is they'll do that and then if they have, like it gets cold or they'll have a, a die off, then you'll end up with a whole lot of rotting plant matter that'll um, affect the water quality. And then salvinia, this is actually a fern. And you can see from that how thick it gets on the water surface. It just mats and lumps and grows and keeps going. It was brought in as an aquarium and pond plant. Um, it's no longer in the aquariums and ponds. Um, interestingly enough, as a side note, when I was at uni um, doing botany and stuff, one of the people I was studying with, his father had the job of naming it. So that's, that's molester because it molests things. Another one that was brought in as a pond plant, water hyacinths. Um, lovely purple flowers, pretty thing. Um, it's, it's actually a big long root system, so it'll pull all of the nutrients out of the water and do all of that. It just forms dense mats and just takes it off. So this was at um, Yarramundi where they've got machines that they use to go through and mechanically harvest this. And this was one I found which the harvesting machine had missed. So there's a few of those. Um, so another one that was widely sold in the aquarium only recently, you know, last few years, banned, was what they used to sell as Halodia, Ageria densa. It's an oxygenating plant for ponds. Um, there's actually a native one, Hydrilla verticillata, which is similar to this, closely related, works just as well. So you know, why wouldn't you get the local native rather than bringing in the exotic? Um, this, again, dense mats, Yarramundi, the same spot that we had the the water hyacinth and the salvinia and all the other weeds. So, um, so yeah, fish. So Australian bass, young fish. There's a young one with the in the top. It's with the nice fins. The young fish are lovely fish. They're inquisitive. They're friendly. They just get big, and they will eat anything that fits in their mouth. So if you've got a farm dam, great for your farm dam. Mm -hmm. They have a marine larval stage as well, so they'll lay their eggs young or go down and then they'll come back upstream into the fresh water once they've gone a bit bigger. Um, eels, big, aggressive. I've seen when we've been catching fish, somebody's caught a small eel, they've had it in a bucket with some other fish and the eel, in spite of supposedly being stressed from having been caught, happily started eating all the rest of the fish in the bucket. So um, the problem with eels is that depending on where you are, They'll tend to often find their way into your pond. They'll swim when it's raining at night. They'll swim over damp grass at night to get upstream into ponds and other water bodies. So they'll um, tend to go. Um, another one you'll sometimes find in the areas that you really don't want to play with is bull routes. Now, Ethys robusta, it's related to stonefish. It has poison spines. And you can see from the blotch pattern, it's what they call an ambush predator. It likes to hide and lurk in the shadows and leap out and grab things. It has a very large mouth. Um, but yeah, you, you really probably don't want it, especially in a pond. You don't want anything with poison spines in a pond. In an aquarium, you might be able to see it, avoid it, do things. You're going to be sticking your hand in a pond. You're not sure what's there. And in that same bucket is Tandanus, Tandanus, the eel-tailed catfish. The baby ones are cute. The baby ones look like a tadpole with whiskers, which is that top corner. But that top fin, that first fin, has a the tip of the spine's poison. So you just don't want to deal with them. And they get a bit big. So as we get towards the end, we'll go through some of the odd bits just to give you some of the idea that you can do some more strange stuff. So in the area, we have the smallest flowering plant in the world. We have some super primitive plants. As I mentioned before, there are freshwater sponges you can get. 
we have carniv carnivorous plants. There's things like water scorpions. There's tiny fish. And there's some strange stuff as well. So if we look here, we have two things in this photo. We have Wolfia australis, which is, they're the little green dots. So if you can see the little green dots in the middle and up in the corner there, that's Wolfia. It's a type of duckweed that has no roots. It's a little spherical thing that just floats on the top of the water. Each one of those is about the size of a pinhead. That is it. It is full size. It is growing. Um, and the one you can see in amongst with it, and you can see where clearer with that branching structure, is Rickia. And the Rickia is a type of aquatic liverwort, and it's a really primitive plant. And it grows and it branches and it grows and it branches. So those that know computer science will know that's called a straight binary tree. That's what it is. And it's a um, floating plant. Um, yeah, it's it's a nice little thing. Just something interesting, different. Um, yeah, freshwater sponges. This is a guy I've known know in Darwin that was growing them in his aqu They just turned up in his aquaculture pond, a couple of them. So you see the freshwater sponges are a bit more green than the um, marine ones. Um, you get all the sun dews. They're all they they all like wet feet and stuff there. So you get all the droseras, you know, bionata and spatulata. Um, Utricularia australis. So there's there's two types of aquatic bladder warts that are fully aquatic. Australis, which is the yellow one, and those little lumps you can see on the leaves, they're all the bladder traps. They they're the suction traps for sucking insects in. And Utricularia gibber, which is more thread like. And this one gets yellow flowers that pop its head up the water. Further down the base of the stem there towards the right, the black black dots are the bladder traps that have actually got stuff in them. And then if you're after some really weird stuff, Aldrovanda vesiculosa, water wheel plant. This is the nearest living relative to a Venus flytrap. It actually uses the same mechanisms as a Venus flytrap to catch its plant. It has walls, leaves, and at the end of the leaf is a little um, trap that snaps shut on things. It also has a real, talk, when we're talking about distribution, this has a really weird distribution. It is found in Poland. It is found in Japan. It is found in Darwin in the Northern Territory. It is found up near Rockhampton. It is found near Evans Head, and it is found down on the south coast of New South Wales. So it is a really weird distribution. It is quite hard to find. And what it does is in the colder areas over winter, the tip of it shrinks into a little compressed bud that sort of sits on the bottom until um, the weather warms up. So Aldrovanda, the water wheel plant, it's um, a little tricky to keep in captivity. So the carnivorous plants, people are keen on it. Another weird one, good old water scorpion. That tube at its back is where it breathes through. So it sits underwater and it's got those little things at the front that it uses to grab it prey with the tube just sticking out of the water where it gets oxygen. So it's um, it breathes through its bum. There's actually one of our species of turtles further up the coast up near Bellingen that um, also is noted for being able to do oxygen exchange through the, through the tissues in its bottom. Um, found in the mangrove areas is Pandaca lidwillii, the smallest vertebrate in Sydney. I thought when I found these first that I found baby fish of some sort. No, that's it, fully grown. They're probably about the size of your little fingernail. So they're only quite small. Um, it's one of them there is eating a worm, I think, because they're a type of goby. And I think goby really means mouth bigger than stomach. And so <laughs> they, they gobies will happily eat just about anything. Um, Euasticus alienus, strange crayfish. That You know those big white buckets you get for things? That fills a white bucket. That's about, I suppose, about over 30 centimetres long from head to tail on the body. Got spines all over it. So Wang Walk River. So, yeah, so different species of crayfish in that that river there. So, and that, and then, so information. So, yeah, so I was spent a while being a member of ANGFA. I haven't done that for a while. But, yeah, so there's some... Websites, actually the New South Wales one may not be working anymore. Um, 
but the, the oops, go back one there. There's FATS, the Frog and Tadpole Study Group, which had a lot of information on ponds and stuff. And I think they were the ones that unfortunately recommended to people to keep mountain clouds in their ponds. Um, and then there's a bunch of books, and I'll show you some of the books in a minute, some of those. Um, and then on a trip up to Darwin, we went, this was found in an old abandoned mine, crate, mine, mine workings crater, Melanotania splendida in ornata, the ornate rainbow fish. Um, they were stunning fish. That was just photographed sort of in a photo tank that I had. Each one of them would have been about 12, 15 centimetres long, the nice big golden fish. So, yes, so what I'll do is I'll stop the sharing so you can see the books more easily.